Good morning. Good morning and welcome to worship on this Lord's Day. We're so glad that each and every one of you are here for the celebration of every Sunday's worship where we lift up the name of Jesus Christ and this special celebration of worship this Sunday where we lift up the commitment of faith to Jesus Christ of our confirmation students. Uh, for those of you who are regular attenders here, we're so glad you're here. For those of you who are visiting, uh, maybe because you're supporting one of our confirmands or this was just the day you happened to choose, you chose a good one. Uh, we're just glad that all of you are here. Those of you who are joining us online as well, welcome. For those of you who are in the room, we'd invite you to take that pew pad and sign in. Let us know that you're worshiping with us today. And I'm just going to highlight a couple of announcements as you do. Uh, in a about a month from today is going to be our women's spring retreat. All women of the church are welcome for a weekend away uh, to enjoy relationships with one another and uh, just some time to reflect and grow in your faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, information is out in the commons and some folks who can help you get signed up. Uh, there is a deadline coming up for that sign up. So if you think you're interested in going, uh, just definitely encourage you to attend. As we celebrate our completed class for confirmation today. Uh, next year's class is coming up. And so if uh, you have a student in your life who is eighth grade or older that you want to know more about confirmation and that experience, next Sunday there's going to be a meeting in between the 9 and 10.30 a.m. services downstairs in the youth room. You can obviously talk to Darren to get all the information you need about that. Now I want to invite up Jim Berner for our Sunday Spotlight. There he is. A couple of years ago, I had the honor of delivering beds to a single mom and her two young boys. As is my usual, I chatted with her, asking which branch of the service she was in, where she served, explaining who made the bed, asking her about her boys, and, and explaining who the bed brigade is. She kept telling the boys to stay back so they didn't get in the way. As I was setting up the twin beds for the boys, the younger one was bouncing in and out of his little fort on his bedroom floor. I mentioned how cool that fort was. It was a really, really cool fort. Thanks, that's where I sleep, he said proudly. As I finished unrolling the mattresses on his bed, I said, well, I hope you enjoy this new bed just as much as you enjoy that fort. Dead silence. And then, what do you mean, my bed? His mother mentioned that he has never had his own bed. He's always had to sleep on the floor with his brother. Really? This is my bed? I've never had a bed before. I don't have to sleep on the floor anymore? Good morning. My name is Jim Berner. I'm the coordinator for Knox's Bed Brigade, and I'm here to ask you to help buy a good night's sleep for those men and women who have honorably served our country and need a hand. The Bed Brigade serves Midwest Shelter for Homeless Veterans based in Wheaton. When one of their case managers has a client that is transitioning to their own place, we provide a complete bed set, including mattress, frame, comforter, sheets, and pillow. Over the past eight years, the Bed Brigade has delivered, set up, and prayed over approximately 500 beds and cribs. Our deliveries have been to Chicago, to DeKalb, Elgin, to Morris. Please stand if you have ever answered my call and delivered a bed. Thank you. Since we started this program, Knox has answered the call to help fund those beds. That's 500 servicemen and women and their sons and daughters who are sleeping a blessed night due to you. Today, I am once again asking for your help. We are looking to replenish our bed fund. Now, the average queen bed costs about $1,400 according to Consumer Affairs, but we actually get ours for $300. Our supplier, Brooklyn Beds, based in Phoenix, Arizona, gives us 
quite a discount. But given the amount of beds we deliver in a year, our account is running low. I know I'm asking a lot. Prices for everyday goods are up quite a lot. Other worthy organizations are requesting funds to continue their efforts. Right here at Knox, we have great missions like Go and Serve, Hesed House, Loaves and Fishes. I could go on and on. But how much is a good night's sleep worth? We are closing this active fundraiser on May 7th. You can give online or via check. And if you are 70 and a half, you can use your IRA with no taxes. <laughs> Some of you know what I do for a living. <laughs> Seriously, see me afterwards if you have any questions on that. Two last points. I greatly appreciate all you do for our community. And I ask that you prayerfully consider helping us continue our mission for providing for veterans and their families. And men, if you haven't signed up for this Saturday's breakfast with our guest speaker, Lynn Lauder, the owner of Rosie's Home Cooking and Vietnam Veteran, Wednesday is the deadline to register. Hopefully you all have received a postcard in the mail. Again, see me with questions afterwards. Thank you very much for your time. As I do see some folks are still finding their way in to find their seats, we, again, today is such a wonderful celebration of a group of young people who are saying yes to committing their lives to following Jesus Christ as a part of this family of faith. Uh, it is it, a vital element of the Christian faith that we do not follow Jesus alone. Once we say yes to Jesus, we are immediately thrown into a community that we are given the gift of brothers and sisters to follow Jesus with. And so it's intentional that we begin every service by acknowledging the people that we are following Jesus with together in this time. So I invite you to stand, greet the people around you, and then remain standing for our call to worship. Let's remain standing as we join together in our responsive call to worship. It's in your bulletins and on the screens. Loving God who called us together as God's people, transform us with your love. Transform our hearts that we may love generously. Transform our eyes that we may see your grace. Transform our hands that we may serve others. Transform our spirits, that we may be the body of Christ, gathered to worship and sent out to serve. Let's sing God's praises together.
You may be seated. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. That is the reality of every human heart. As hard as we may try, as much as we may want to follow Jesus faithfully, we wander, we fail, we fall short. So thanks be to God, the responsibility is not on us to perfectly follow God, but the invitation is before us to be brought back time and time again, to be forgiven, to be restored, to be given a new chance to start again. So in this time of confession, that's what we're doing. Admitting the ways that we have wandered and being brought back to God's loving embrace again. I invite you to join me together in our unison prayer of confession, which will be followed by a time of silence for personal confession. Let us pray. Caring God, you call us to be the body of Christ, to live in community, to care for one another, to use our different gifts. Instead of working to sustain community, we follow our own desires. Instead of trusting in your care, we think we can do it alone. Forgive our neglect of others. Give us obedient spirits that we may care for one another, depend on your love, and use our gifts for your gospel. Amen. Amen. Friends, hear this good news from the scriptures. It says, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into God's marvelous light. The God who created you, who called you, who loves you, has forgiven you and sets you free. Amen. Let's stand and sing our responsive phrase together. You may be seated, and I would like to invite our children up for our children's message this morning. Good morning. So today is a special day for our eighth graders. Some of them have joined us up here. Some are in the pews and they are always welcome to come up. They are going to be confirmed today, and that is such a special day on their faith journey, a day that I'm sure they will remember for the rest of their lives. You are all growing up here at Knox, and many of our confirmands grew up here at Knox as well. As part of their confirmation, they would gather on Sunday evenings for extra time to study about their faith, what it means to be members of the church, 
and their relationship with Christ. They recently had a whole weekend away called the Weekend of Decision, where all 17 of them have decided to profess their faith and join the church. It's a very special time in their lives, and we are so blessed to be a part of it. And it's something that all of you get to look forward to on your faith journey as well. Because just like in school and in life, we're constantly learning. You can't dive deep into a pool until you learn how to swim. You can't run in a race until you first learn how to walk. Your faith journey is much like that. You hear Bible stories in Sunday school and at VBS, and we do different activities and crafts to help the lessons kind of sink in. You come to church, and you grow older in years and in your faith, and you start to look at different things from a different perspective. You have more questions, and you dive a little deeper into Scripture and the lessons that you gain from it. So this morning, I pray that each one of you feel the love and warmth from this church, and I pray the same for all of our confirmands today. Seems like only yesterday, many of you were this little coming up for these children's messages. So let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for the gift of this church family. Thank you for the learning and growing that we are able to do together. May you bless each one of these children and our confirmands as they continue to grow closer to you and closer to each other. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. All right, you may head to Sunday school or back with your families. Good morning. Today's reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 13. Now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many members, all the members of the body, through many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. The word of the Lord. Thank you, Nicole. Our second reading comes from the Epistle to the Romans in chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Listen now for the word of God. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. 
We have gifts that differ according to the grace given us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, before I begin my sermon this morning, I just uh, want to address expectations It is Confirmation Sunday, and we will, in due course, celebrate the confirmands, but uh, I want to encourage you not to expect my sermon to be just about confirmation. They are joining the church, the body of Christ, and so the sermon is for all of us, the church, the body of Christ. In what sense are we as Christians, alive. And after that, what does it mean for us as Christians to sacrifice? Paul calls us to be living sacrifices. These are our questions for today. And this concludes my introduction. (laughs) Perhaps the Apostle Paul is confused when he exhorts the Romans to be living sacrifices. After all, he has called them dead once already. In chapter 6, Paul muses about the life of those forgiven by grace. What shall we say then, he wonders? Shall we go on sinning? that grace may abound. Paul, in that chapter, is considering an argument that the Christians in Rome had begun to make. Their argument goes like this. If grace comes because of sin, should we not endeavor to sin so that we would experience grace on grace? Do we, as Christians, get more grace by continuing to sin? is the right way to experience God's grace through greater sin. And Paul's response, by no means you have died to sin. How can you live in it any longer? When exactly, we might wonder, did these Roman Christians die to sin? Well, They died when Christ did. When Christ gave up his life as a ransom for many, when Christ, who knew no sin, became sin for us and suffered death, even death on a cross. In the death of Christ, the Roman Christians died as well. Not dead to God, not dead to one another, dead to sin. And the same is true for us. All of us who have been baptized have died with Christ. Yes, baptism is a moment in which we are washed and we are cleansed of all unrighteousness, a chance to be made clean and new. But baptism is also a death. This is a church that sprinkles, and so sometimes the image is lost on us, but but imagine immersion going into the water as going into the grave, dying with Christ in that sacrament. In the Lord's Supper, we eat and drink Christ's body and blood. We take on his death. All of us who call Christ Lord, Lord, share in, participate in Christ's death. We remain, of course, mortal. We will experience at some moment in the future the physical death common to all humans, but that death has, as Paul says, no sting. Death no longer has any power or capacity to separate us from God, to unbind us from God. It is a hollow, empty kind of death because we have already died. 
We have died to sin. We have died to the curse of evil. We are not bound, enslaved, or captive to these forces any longer. Christ, as we know and rightfully celebrate, did not remain dead. The third day he rose again to new life, a life that could no longer die. But Christ carries the scars of his death. He did not go back in time to live a life that did not die. His resurrection, to put it differently, did not undo his death. He lives as one who has died. He carries his death within him. And so for us, who are knit to Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, we too carry our death with Christ as we journey towards the age to come. We remember Christ's death in our sacraments as our own death and live in the light of that death which is ours. We live as those who have died. Which, to put it differently, is to say that we live in freedom. We are free. Free from the powers of sin and the curse of death. We live free from bondage to Satan, from the fear and anxiety and worry and hopelessness that marks the cosmos yet unredeemed. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and life to the full free from Satan, sin, and death. We are free towards God in Jesus Christ. Free to live for Christ, free to live for God, which is how we were originally made. It is said, our chief end is to glorify God and enjoy God forever. And because of our death, this is how we can live. As Christians, we live as those who have already died in freedom to love and serve the Lord. And we do this as a sacrifice. Sacrifice is at once simple and complicated. Simple in definition to give up, to relinquish that which is in some way mine, for the sake of another. Time, talent, treasure is the phrase, the kinds of things that that can be sacrificed. But it's complicated because we know that deeper definition of sacrifice, which includes death. An animal sacrificed on an altar to God and then burned, perhaps, or eaten. A soldier Sacrifice for the nation. A son. Sacrificed for the father. Paul modifies sacrifice with the phrase living. A living sacrifice. I just described life, the kind of life that you and I share as Christians, with the phrase, as those who have died. How then do those who have died and are now living offer sacrifice? What does it mean for us to die again? Or is this a new kind of sacrifice that doesn't include death? To begin to understand this description of Christian life, living sacrifice, we must understand this phrase, already and not yet. Already and not yet. This is the phrase that we use to describe the life we live in between Easter Sunday and the return of Christ in the age to come. Already, because we have died with Christ and achieved victory over sin and death. Not yet, because the fullness of that victory, the consummation of God's rescue is still to come. 
God has saved us in Jesus, adopted us as sons and daughters, and we fully belong to God. The Spirit of God is at work within us. But we are not yet perfect. We are not yet complete. As Paul says in this passage, we are being transformed by the renewing of our minds. We are not yet those perfect images of Jesus. We, having died with Christ and been raised with him, must continue to die to ourselves. To die to the desire that we have for sin. To die to the habits we have, which continue to turn us away from God. Our sacrifice is a daily death to all that is not Christ within us. Already Christ's, we are not yet complete and perfect. And so living, we must sacrifice. This is then the paradox at the heart of the Christian life, the paradox revealed on the cross and imprinted on all those who follow Jesus. The death of Jesus led to new life, a life that doesn't erase or forget the death endured, but a new life on the other side of that death, carrying that death in the scars of the hands and the feet, the memory of the mind, the body of the one who died. And we too died with Christ and live on the other side of death. But to live in God's mercy means living a life of daily dying. Daily sacrifice. Dying to self, dying to the world, dying to all that is not holy and acceptable to the God who raised us from the dead. We know, of course, that we don't always live this way. We, we err often in one of two ways. First, in trying to live without having died. And second, as living as those who have died, but without any further sacrifice. So the first way trying to live without having died. Sometimes, in our journey towards Christ, we forget to carry the death, trying instead to live the new life in the Spirit without the scars of the cross. And for this, there is a phrase, cheap grace. Cheap grace. A grace that we can expect to come to us without cost. Cost for us or cost for God. Sin becomes trivialized in our hearts and in our lives, in our communities. It's no big deal, we think to ourselves, or perhaps say to one another, if this sin is allowed to persist. We don't have to ask the hard questions about what is right, what is righteous, what is holy and acceptable to God, because God will just forgive us for whatever we fail to understand. We don't need to take seriously to hold account ourselves or one another for the sin we commit because God's grace takes care of it for us. The life, though, that we live in this cheap grace becomes shallow. Worship becomes unimportant. God has saved me. Uh, I've got the grace. Why do I need to continue with this Sunday morning ritual? Why bother to go down to sing and pray when the grace I need is mine already? Serving the body of Christ has no purpose for cheap grace. I've gotten what I need out of God. Why should I give any of that to someone else? Cheap grace is neither hot nor cold, lukewarm, and much to be pitied. When we live this way, and I suspect we all will at one time or another, corporately or individually, we have forgotten that we have died and so cheapen God's grace and our living The second way that we can err, 
Just as it happens that Christians live without carrying death to sin and death, it also can happen that we live as those who have died, but without any further sacrifice. We may take seriously Christ's death, and so not cheapen grace, but we fail to allow that death of Christ to become our own, to seek in our own lives, in every place, to allow the death of Christ to become our own. There is a kind of stagnation in these lives and in these communities. A reliance on God's grace to save, yes, but a half-hearted response to grow in the image of Christ. It is difficult work to let your life be a sacrifice. To turn to God again and again and ask what more, what's next. It's frightening to be open to what God might say, to make ourselves and our lives and our communities open to God's possibility. It is a sacrifice. It might not be that God is looking simply for you to give more money or more time to the church. It might be that God is ready to radically reshape your whole life. Perhaps to leave something behind. A job that brings security and wealth and even self-importance, but it is not God's will for you. And so you must step out into the uncertainty and fear of following God's lead. Or perhaps you bring something or someone in Maybe God is pushing you to dive headlong into the heartache and difficulty of reconciliation, exhorting you to welcome someone who was once estranged. And it's not just for us as individuals, but as the church, as Knox, it very well may be that God is calling us to radically reshape our common life together, to walk away from the safety and security of the past successes of this church, to set aside ministries that we love, to imagine and reimagine the new work God is calling us to, to sacrifice, to offer a living, breathing sacrifice to the God who did it first. I'm going to close with a story. A friend of mine, who was my pastor when I lived in North Carolina, had a large family. He had six children with his wife. And many years ago at this point, his wife and he felt called to consider adoption. And they prayed about it, and they thought about it, and they came to know that that is what God was leading them to. And so they had to reorient their whole lives. They had to get rid of the minivan and get a 12-passenger van. They had to convert rooms in their house into bedrooms. And so, after the three biological children came three more adopted children, and they began this journey as a family. And that's where I met them with six kids, a house that was mostly bedrooms, and a 12-passenger van. And wouldn't you know, there was a little girl in pre-K in the same county that we lived in, that that family heard about as needing a home. And I had an interesting conversation with my pastor. As we talked about this little girl, as he let me know some of her story, I asked him what him and his wife were doing, and he said, oh, we we don't have to talk about it again. We don't have to ask whether or not we will make space for this child. 
He said, 15 years ago, when we first said yes, that was our yes. That was a permanent yes. And now, this couple, their oldest is graduating high school, their youngest is in fourth grade, and they're going to bring a pre-K girl into their family. And they didn't hesitate. They didn't wonder. They didn't ponder. They had already so reshaped and reoriented their life to say yes to God's call that it was no difficulty in continuing this sacrifice. And if you ask them about it, they would tell you, we don't know any other way to live. Amen. Would you join me in prayer? God, we thank you so much for the gift of your holy word, for the gift, Lord, of this church and for this church community. Lord, we ask that these words would sink deep into our hearts and minds and that we would become for you living sacrifice to your glory and honor now and forever. Amen. We come now to the portion of the service where we get to celebrate the work of our confirmands. For this full year, beginning in September, uh, they have been meeting on Sunday evenings in the basement with me to study scripture. They've been attending worship services. Um, We've had fun together. We've worked hard together. We've served together. And all of this Uh, was done to listen for God's call on their lives to come and follow me, as Jesus says in Mark's gospel. And they have said yes. And it has been a delightful year for me personally. I want to thank those who participated. Um, I want to start by thanking Arlene Beslick, who was our lunch coordinator, as well as the four teachers, Jen Volbrecht, Chloe Wazorek, Josh Weir, and Kirk Seitz, and I want to thank my director who did um, so much work (laughs) on my behalf, Sarah Stone, um, and all the parents who brought meals, if we could give them a round of applause. I know many of you have been praying for these confirmands this year, and I want to thank you for that as well and encourage and invite you to continue to be in prayer because next week I start looking to the next year. Uh, It is a joy that this church continues year after year to have a strong confirmation program. It is a testament um, to what this church is and to who we are and to our commitment to uh, disciple young people to follow Christ. All right. I want to at this time invite Josh um, as an elder forward, and we will begin celebrating and recognizing these confirmands. Oh yeah, I stole that from you. For the past year, these 17 bright, curious, and uniquely amazing students have been on a journey. They've been studying the scriptures, learning the doctrines of the church, and wrestling with questions of faith. They participated in worship and are glad to continue their journeys in faith in our community. On behalf of the session, I would like to present the following to the church as having completed the requirements of confirmation. Ashley Dravalis. Ryan Gears. Lauren Hill. Mason Hill. Lucas Ivans. 
Sahana Koratala, Charles Kroll, Charlotte Loon, Peyton Minor, Elena Seitz, Danielle Stone, Carter Straub, Maxwell Teets, Cole Walker, Alexander Weir, Megan Wasorek, and Eli Zogby. On behalf of Session, I would like to present these confirmands to be commissioned as active church members. We rejoice in your desire to declare your faith, become a member of Christ's church, and share with us in our common ministry. So friends, it was a delight to meet with you guys on Wednesday night and to hear you share your personal stories of what confirmation has meant to you this past year, and what becoming a follower of Jesus Christ will mean to you in all the years to come. And we've practiced them unofficially, but we're about to do it officially. You're about to make some pretty big promises. But I want to remind you, as you make these promises as individuals today, you do so only because some really big promises were made for you. Most of you before you were even aware of it. For many of you, it may have been even in this church, your parents stood up here and you were baptized. And when you were baptized, your parents made promises. They declared their own faith in Jesus Christ and they made a promise that they would raise you in the love and faith of Jesus Christ to the end that this day would happen. That when you were able to do so, you would make your own declaration of your faith in Jesus Christ. And so those promises that your parents made on your behalf, you're getting to claim those as your own today. But it wasn't just your parents who made promises. Everybody that you see out here made a promise as well. Because uh, here's something I know to be true. Do you, I'm going to ask a question, and I think I know the answer. Do you always listen to everything your parents say? <laughs> I know this is true. And so uh, God knew this. God knew this was true, that as we become adults, we start to step away from our parents, but that doesn't mean we don't need help. We need some other people sometimes other than our parents to tell us the exact same thing our parents would tell us. And so this, this is why we have this. We have a family of faith of people who are going to tell you how much God loves you in Jesus Christ. And that because maybe it's not your parents telling you, maybe you'll believe it. And so they made promises too, to teach your Sunday school classes to lead your youth group, to lead your confirmation class, to pray for you, to financially support ministry so you can go on things like Weekend of Decision. They made those promises when you were baptized. And so because they made that promise, you get to stand up here and make your promise today. And so in these promises, you are standing on the shoulders of people who have loved you for a very long time and who will continue to love you as you take more and more steps in following Jesus Christ as part of this family of faith. And so I have some questions for you. And you know what I said about these questions, right? I want to I believe you when you answer them. Friends, who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. Amen. And do you trust him? I do. And do you intend to be his disciple, to obey his word, and to show his love? I do. I believe you. Josh, let's lead us in prayer. Holy God, we praise you for calling us to be a servant people 
and for gathering us into the body of Christ. Thank you for adding to our family of faith. Together, may we live in your spirit and so love one another that we may have the mind of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom we give honor and glory forever. Amen. It's my honor and privilege to present to you the 17 newest members of Knox Presbyterian Church. Let's pray together. Good and gracious God, our Father in heaven, we pray with joy for our confirmants, for these bright, curious, uniquely amazing young people who have today affirmed their faith in you. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon them. Fill them with the gifts of faith, hope, and love. When they are discouraged, empower them. When they are lonely, set them in communities. And help them to carry your light into this world. Lord God, we pray for this church, for Knox Presbyterian. Help us to receive with thankfulness the gift that our young people are. Open our hearts and minds to new perspectives, changing circumstances, and new ways of doing things, that we might proclaim the gospel anew in every generation. We pray also for the leadership of our church, for wisdom and discernment as we engage in our Isaiah 6 project, and for the church throughout the world. Good and gracious God, we pray for this world you created and the world that you love. Where there is violence, grant peace. Where there is oppression, grant justice. Where there is division and conflict, grant reconciliation. We especially lift up to you today the people of Ukraine and Sudan. We pray, Lord God, for those we know who are in need, who are hurting, especially for those who are ill or on hospice, for those who are addicted or unemployed, for those who are hopeless or alone. We name them before you now in the silence of our hearts. All these things we ask, Lord God, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. One of the things we do as part of our common life here at Knox is return to God some of what he's given to us. And there are a lot of ways we can do that with our financial resources. You can see them on the screen. You can give via text, you can give online, or you can give a physical offering. If you've brought one with you today and you would like to make such an offering, there are boxes in the back in which you can place it. I now invite you to stand and sing as we give thanks to God for what he's given us. Heavenly Father, we give to you today a tiny token of what you have already given us. Our lives and bodies in this world, our friends and families, and most of all, your redemptive love, stronger than sin, stronger than death. We thank you, Lord, and we pray you accept our offering. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Let's sing. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. 
I want to invite the confirmands to come huddle right here. Quick, quick, don't wait, just go. <laughs> All right, come, come right down here, come right down here. Scoot, scoot, come around. Scoot, scoot, scoot. All right. As we say the benediction, I want to invite the congregation to just raise a hand up and over these 17 young men and women. And now may the God of peace who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep. By the blood of the eternal covenant, make you complete in everything good, so that you may do his will among us. All this through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, head out first.